Thank you. How am I? Thank you to all the people who are here and all the people who are listening to me remotely. So just before starting the speech, a couple of things. Can you hear me? I study the data published by um, historical researchers. So I talk about facts. Sometimes I put my personal point of view, but I always make sure to separate it from the facts, from the facts that I know. I do public speaking because um, it seems that helps with self-confidence because it helps me or makes me studying and researches. So confirming and increasing my knowledge. My speech will last for about 40, 45 minutes. And after that, if you've got any query, ask me anything. There are no state secrets. But the map here, there's not, not that you can see it hugely, but at least to have an idea of where the facts that I'm gonna talk about today happens from Bologna about here down to, to Rome, the capital of the city. So, this is a portrait attribute, attributed to Lavinia Fontana. The title is Portrait of a Lady with a Dog. And it's held at Oakland Art Gallery, Toyo Tamaki, to which I'm very, very thankful because twice, twice they allowed me to photograph the painting, which is in a lab, so you can't see it at the moment, before restoration and after part of it. So I'll use this painting, which is Italian, but in New Zealand. So put together a bit what I did when I was born in Italy, grew up there and emigrated to New Zealand to talk about re Renaissance in Italy. Lavinia Fontana was born in 1552 in Bologna, which is in the northern part of central Italy, and died in 1614 in Rome. So just introduce the environment a little bit. Um, Renaissance has been described by several historians as a new en an encompassment of new ideas and new fashions. And it finished in Italy, it finished in 1592 when Galileo Galilei was appointed professor of mathematics at Padova University. That's when things changed. The country, the various state of the country were principalities, they began to change from that into um, um, dynastic monarchic states ruled by foreigners. So the gap between governments and street people widened and will be like that for about two and a half centuries. Um, the principalities simply run out of money because all the art patronage and all the public infrastructure, especially in the countryside. And another thing that took place after the Renaissance was the shifting of the money from the Mediterranean to the Northern Atlantic. And an example was the Gonzaga family, the Duke of Mantua, who had to sell almost his extremely precious collection of paintings to the King of England. So in the Renaissance, they had and they wanted new things. 
So they were in a way trying out new ideas. Bologna, where she was born, that was in the Papa State, was a very peculiar city. Bologna was a city of centers of new ideas. The first university in the West, at least, was in Bologna, Alma Mater Studiorum, set up in 1088. So Bologna, like other centers, but Bologna was very much on the front line of trying new things. And about 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, a book was discovered that had an amazing information. In um, 1256, in Bologna, so when Bologna was uh, an independent state, not under the Pope, in Bologna, they abolished slavery. Slavery. In 1256, in Bologna, all slavery was abolished. 500 years before the abolishment of, slav of slavery in the 18th century. This um, new behavior was not continued in Bologna at a later stage or in other countries where it went forgotten. So I'm saying this to try and explain that Bologna was a place of ideas, of thinking, of studying. And Lavinia Fontana was a lucky person who also was able to take advantage of her luck and develop it. Her father was a painter. So she learned paintings at home. She also learned to be very detailed, which was typical of the Renaissance. In, in Renaissance paintings, in general terms, you find many more small details than in previous type of paintings. And her father encouraged her to paint. We are talking about the second half of the 1500s when no women were painting, very rarely, very rarely. There were no schools for painting for women. You have to wait the 19th century, so 300 years for the first women painting schools. So she came from this um, fertile ground. Also, she married at the age of 25, which was quite late for the time for a woman to marry. So she had learned the trade. We don't know if she had produced paintings before she got married, but she learned the trade before getting married. And she married somebody from Imola, which is close to Bologna, by here. I used to go to school. It's quite funny. I used to go to school in Imola, a high school, and I did the university in Bologna. And um, her husband was a trader in art. So that also helped. And their marriage, there was a contract which was typical of the time because the concept of the marriages for love was introduced only during enlightenment in the 1700s. So before that marriages were usually for a, a, a practical interest. And in the contract there was that they, she and her husband had to live in the paternal house, which to me says of a certain kind of open-mindedness of a father towards women, or at least towards his daughter. So inside the house, she could start her business of painting. And her husband, as a uh, art dealer, was running her earnings. So we don't know when this painting was done, but probably was done when she was still 
in Bologna before going to Rome. So when she was not yet as known as she was going to be. See, look at the details, the lines, the ornaments, the design, the bottoms, the shades behind the bottoms. The weaving and the movement of the dress. That also it's clear that she's sitting down on a chair. It doesn't give the impression of being stopped, immovable. The dog on the laps was um, a sign of marital fidelity. So a very positive sign for a woman. And the ear has been, she made it bigger than what, the right ear, than what she originally painted it. And also they x-rayed the uh, painting. And where there are the hands, behind the hands, there is no dog. So first she paints, she painted the hands, the dog afterwards. So see the skin under the dog eye, great detail. The shadows of the bottoms was typical of the Renaissance, this part of the dress. Check the face, the face expression. It's not certainly a still expression. It does give or may give a bit of a sense of almost teasing the audience. Almost like wanting to attract people. The hair are neatly done, with one exception that was pointed out by the art historian. This, see, this is completely different from the rest. Everything is, I would say, perfect, careful, on a line, not this. This comes out almost like the hairdresser had been careless. And some historians say that it could be a sign of the Renaissance of breaking away from the past and introducing a new idea. Mind you, this is a point of view of art historians. Eh? Art history is a lot of point of view. So somebody else can have another idea. But it's quite interesting, this little bit of hair and this smile, tease, so, sort of things put together. To me personally, they give a sense of, um, it's just me you know, sort of thing. That's, it is the personal story that they found part of the chair. Of course, she was sitting down on a chair, but before the story, they couldn't find it. And um, Lavinia Fontana, takes advantage of her luck. And as I said before, builds on it. And in 1583, they produces the assumption to heaven of the Virgin. Again, you can see, oh, sorry. 
the details of the angels, you can see the legs, the feet, the face, the expressions, and this space, this conduce, tunnel, whatever, of light. The Virgin Mary has died and awaits for her son to give the permission to go up to the kingdom of heaven. See, she looks up towards here. Because that's where the permission comes from. During the Renaissance, the position of the Virgin Mary in relation to Jesus was of subsidiary, really. Was of a secondary position. To the contrary of the Middle Ages, when Mary and the son were almost at the same level. So different ages, different thinking. If you, if you check the painting of Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel behind the altar, the last judgment, the, the Virgin Mary almost asks her son to forgive everybody, but he has already made up his own mind. That's it. So she is in a secondary position toward the son in the Renaissance. But the importance of this painting for Lavinia Fontana is because she was the first woman painter in the West to be given, to be employed by a church client to produce a painting of a religious subject in a church place, that's the cathedral in Imola. Lavinia Fontana is the most known woman Renaissance painter, not just in Italy, but in Europe. And a lot of paintings are traceable back to her. So she really stood up in the 1500 and early 1600 in Europe in, paint, in the painting business. And she also took on the men who were almost completely the only ones so in 1583, Lavinia Fontana became, began to become a sort of rebel. So beginning to enter in a world that almost always for women was prohibited. She begins to become more famous. She in Bologna, she begins to paint um, important ladies, ladies belonging to the nobility. And it becomes more or less fashionable to be painted by her. So they call her Pittora with the A. So Pittora, woman painter. Pittore with an E would be a man painter, but they call it the Pittora, la Pittora, because it's the only one who can do that at her level. And um, because of this, she in the 1580s, 1590s, she starts really being famous. And <laughs> Again, with luck and with using her brains to use her luck, she moves to Rome in 1603. Why does she move to Rome? Rome, there is the Pope. Can't be that. There is much more money. It's a much bigger place. So. The, the patronage is at least potentially much wider. 
but also because in Rome, there was Cardinal Bernerio, who was not just a commitment um, um, client of her, but was a supporter. And the Cardinal was inside the Vatican, some, somehow around the Pope. Not all of this, but with the luck step in is two years later in 1605, uh, Cardinal Camillo Borghese, who was the legate of the Pope in Bologna, the legate was the person who had the administration of the city. So it, it was in between the papal government and the city of Bologna, becomes Pope Paul V. And he knows Lavinia Fontana and he supports Lavinia Fontana and he becomes the Pope and she is in Rome. And God knows why her job goes to the roof. She begins to receive orders from around Italy. So from distance up to the point that it's too much. It's too much. She can't do everything. So she has to start saying no to clients. That tells you how much work she had. Like all painters, like all artists, she was very expensive, really expensive, wanted to make the money. And she had to drop some work. In 1611, there was a medal produced in Rome to commemorate Lavinia Fontana. And we come to when she reached the top of her career, Minerva dressing. Minerva was a Roman goddess, the Roman goddess of victory. She's the first Western female nude produced by a woman. She was the first one. This painting that seems a painting of a woman, of a naked woman, but you can't see any sexual parts or what, you know, that, that doesn't even seem anything particular. With this painting, she really goes through breaks academic orthodoxy and she so is allowed to paint whatever she wants. That also means she had access to women, female or male nudes. Again, very difficult that women had it at the time. So this is a young woman, no, sorry. By the side, naked, but you can only see this. So that's not a big deal, is it? And she has, again, a face expression of happiness and Maybe a touch of naughtiness, really, being a little naughty. Almost saying, that's what I'm doing, and you look at me, but you are there. So you can't really get too close to me. That's what the, some art historians say, anyhow. And you have like two different scenes in one room. You can't see it very well, but it is a, a shield, a war shield, and the helmet. So she was wearing a war dress, fighting, fighting for her principles, fighting for her ideas. So defending her way of thinking, her way of life, her world. But then dropping that, they are here, they are on the floor. 
and clearly moving because she does give the impression of moving to collect the dress, to put it on. See Minerva dressing. Minerva wins with the helmet and with the shield, defends her principles. But once it's finished, she is able to put it in the past and do something new. And that's the Renaissance. Stop the Middle Ages, stop the type of thinking, right or wrong, doesn't matter, stop it and get something new. So she gives the impression of being a happy young woman, of being in charge of what she does. That's what she does. Can't change it. She does it very calmly, no rush, <coughs> no problems. So she's an independent woman who, as a consequence of this, excuse me, I drink a bit of water. So who as in the consequence of these steps into a world that for her was possibly unknown, but certainly prohibited. So really she takes on men painters in their own world. And it's not that there are a lot of women who do it. She is the only one, she is the only one. So she may have the disadvantage of not being supported by other people, but at the same time, she may have the advantage of being a novelty. So of being um, welcome because there is a new player in the market. And it goes back to the concept of re Renaissance, an encompassment of new ideas and new fashions. This painting was painted in 1613, the year before she died. So in 1614, she finishes her life. And um, to tell you how strong-minded she was, Lavinia Fontana, with all the paintings she produced, had 11 pregnancies, 11, all finished with the giving birth, all of them. And she painted all those paintings. And a couple of her daughters had the first name of a couple of her best ladies, clients. That was another way of keeping in touch and developing a business. So putting together a lucky position with intelligence. Not only this, but towards the end of her life, she had arthritis in her right hand. She was a right-handed painter. She wasn't painting with her left hand. So when she had arthritis, she was painting. Imagine the hurt of painting. She kept doing it but kept doing it at high level. I can't imagine what she had gone through, that poor woman, but that's what she wanted to do. And to me, personally, what strikes the most is her ability to put quantity and quality together. Since there is an Italian say that says literally, quantity does not go with quality. Well, she proved it's not always like that. There is a comment, posthum, 
about her by an art historian called Giovanni Baglione. And I'd like to read it to you because to me it encapsulates what Lavinia Fontana was able to do. So I'm just reading. She came to Rome at the time of Pope Clement VIII and received many commissions there. Many of those commissions were portraits. The subjects were mainly noble Roman ladies, especially princesses, but they were also princes and cardinals. Her portraits commanded high fees and earned her widespread fame as well as a handsome profit. Among her contemporaries, Lavinia was regarded as exceptionally talented in the field of portraiture. So that's what a professional, an art historian wrote about her. The legacy, the main part of the legacy of Lavinia Fontana, especially looking at it from today, is that she was able to break into a man-dominated world. And more or less, she was the only one and she was staying there. So let's now step more into Renaissance. I use this painting because it's Italian, because it was produced in Bologna, which is the region where I come from, and because it's in New Zealand. So put the two things together, at least from my perspective. But we can't say more about the Renaissance. So we have said that the Renaissance was a time for new things, geographical discoveries, art patronage, Protestantism, that was another new thing. There was also like a response to the conquest of Constantinople by the Muslims, so a different religion in 1453, with humanism. Humanism was searching for proofs about theories, to prove theories right. Art patronage skyrocketed. So before during the Middle Ages, there were, of course, um, clients who were ordering paintings, statues, whatever. So they were putting some money, but at a much smaller case. During the Renaissance, these ballooned. That's why I said at the end of the 1500, principalities began to have problems with money because not many bobs were left in the kitty. These two ladies helped a lot with art patronage in the Renaissance, helped in the sense of starting it. The one to the right is Lucrezia Borgia. Now, don't believe a word of what you hear of Lucrezia Borgia because when you study the data published by art historian, um, um, historical researchers, so the historians who study the documents about Lucrezia Borgia, they tell you completely different things, completely different things. So, she is one of the many cases where historiography told a lot of, let's call them mistakes about a person. And the other one is, to the left, Isabella Gonzaga. Isabella Gonzaga was from Ferrara and Lucrezia Borgia was marrying in the second marriage the, the son of the Duke of Ferrara, the one who became the Duke. So they met 
here. That's what I photographed. 2019, I, I went back to Italy. I'm sorry for the darkness of the photograph, but they met here. The, the castle, this is the medieval entrance. The Renaissance entrance is opposite. If you can look through somehow there is, you can see the other entrance. So this side is the medieval part of the city. The opposite is the Renaissance part of the city. And the two ladies, Lucrezia Borgia and Isabella Este Gonzaga met here. When Lucrezia arrived in Ferrara from Pesaro to, to get married. And Isabella, the, the, the sister of, of, of the former, of the Duke to be, of the, of the groom, was here to welcome her. And they got on. Perhaps they got on as women get on. So perhaps they got on that way. But anyway, they got on and they became huge patrons of art, directly and indirectly through their husbands. So the, this was at the beginning of the 1500s. So it was to kickstart what was happening during the century. To give you an example, Isabella d'Este Gonzaga was painted with a particular dress. The painting was seen by the Queen of Poland in Warsaw. And she wanted the dress. So Isabella d'Este Gonzaga was making fashion, fashion. But is it really true that these new ideas during the Renaissance were really brand new, never ever thought or applied in the past? See, trade and markets, 2000 years ago, the first shopping center, four or five levels with staircases to go up and down. At different levels, different shops, different goods to sell and buy. And the facade or facade. This way, typical of the Renaissance. But this was 1500 years before the Renaissance. From books. The architect was Vitruvius. Somebody discovered the books of Vitruvius, read it, saw it, liked it and reproduced it. But 1500 years before, someone else had done it with great engineering knowledge, because that's only the front, there is also the back. So let's talk about books a little bit. Now the first time the books traveled was during the sixth century AD, when they went from Byzantium to Ravenna, which is in the same region of Bologna, but here, which is the region where I come from. Actually, I come from the province of Ravenna because Ravenna was under, by the time Byzantine rules. So these books were sent by Emperor Justinian to Ravenna that was run on his behalf by a guy called Severino Boesio, who was really the prototype of the intellectual serving 
a lord. In this guy, in this case, the emperor, the Eastern Roman emperor who was trying to conquer the whole old Roman Empire again. Then he failed and didn't happen. Why is this? Because in Turkey, in northern Turkey, in southern Greece, was full of libraries and full of books. And they were all in the East, not in the West. As an example, the biggest private library of the West would have had 20, 30, 50, 100 books at the most. But what they said, the library in the East had 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 books. So there was this enormous, enormous amount of books written by the ancient Greeks, also by Latin at the time of Rome, but mainly by ancient Greeks. <coughs> Philosophy, calculus, geometry, physics, chemistry, astronomy, Latin, Greek, history, geography, everything. So what happened when the Muslims begin to reach that area? They, some of them learn Latin and Greek from Christian people who had the education to know it. They learned it. So the knowledge was passed from one side to the other. So there was a collaboration. So this happened a lot before the burning of the huge library in Alexandria. When that happens, things had gone a different way. But until then, there was a collaboration. But of course, differences, different ways of seeing the world, etc. But there was also collaboration wanting to understand the other person. So the Muslims find all these books, all of them, in ancient Greeks or in Latin. They want to learn them <laughs> like that. In that language, very few people can read it, it becomes very difficult. So what do they do? When they conquer Spain, they set up translation center in Spain. Toledo becomes the biggest one and they shift those books or a lot of them from Northern Turkey, Southern Greece to nowadays Spain, where those books are translated from ancient Greeks, mainly or Latin, into Arabic. Then by the 1100s, 1200s, the Christians get together and slowly begin to conquer or free from their point of view, Spain. And, but they have different things have changed, turned upside down. And the Muslim know that those were Christian destroy things. They don't want Muslim things, nothing. So what happens? They shift the books from Spain to Palermo in Sicily. This guy, Avaroe, read the books of Aristotle, where he learned that you can make religious belief and scientific proof coexist together to avoid bloodshed. So he writes his own book about that. And this guy, Scottish, who had turned Muslim, had converted to Islam, takes the book to Palermo, together with the other books. What happens in Palermo? In Palermo, an amazing things happen. There are the Normans in Sicily. See, I even have a separate speech about the Normans in Sicily, because 
I guarantee you that is an, an unbelievable story about the Normans in Sicily. That I can't tell you now, of course. But in Palermo, the books written in Arabic are translated back into Latin, all of them, because Latin was the language of Western Europe. So all of them could read. In Sicily, in Southern Italy, in Palermo with the Normans, there is a, 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 an incredible culture flourishing artistically, financially, they were producing sugar, to give you an example. And um, they also produced maps of the world, which turned out to be quite correct. <coughs> but then it finishes. So the books are taken from Palermo to Paris. And that's why Paris becomes the cultural center of Western Europe and of Europe in general. Cultural in terms of thought, philosophy, and of writing, literature, because um, Assisi became the center of art, of cultural art. That's a different story. So when they are in Palermo, uh, in Paris, the books trigger the mind of people, especially of the clergy, because they were the main people in, in a numerical sense who could read and write. Because there is this coexistence of scientific proof and divine revelation. Some accept it, some don't. And that sets ablaze the whole environment. And from there, the fight in between science and religion starts. Or if it doesn't start, it really takes off. So this is what I call, what I personally call the road of books from where people took the ideas. See, so this is the agreement in between the Pope, West, and the Emperor of, Byz of Byzantium East in Florence in 1439 to try and defend Constantinople from the, from, the, from the Ottomans. So what happened? Another lot, huge lot of books was sent from Byzantium to Florence. And that's how Florence became the cradle of the Renaissance. And a lot of historians consider the Renaissance roots starting in 1439, but there was that meeting when the Pope and the Emperor were there together and with the books right there. There are some historians, I'm just telling you what I found out, who argue that the knowledge of the American continent didn't start in 1492, started at the beginning of 1400, almost one century before the trip of Cristóvão Colombo. I'm just putting you this information that I found out. So, of course, this needs to be studied much deeper. But some historians are beginning to say this. And to conclude, See, another example is the dome of the Florence Cathedral. That was in the 1400s. In the 1400s, they built the, uh, this on the ground. 
And with cranes in timber, they lift this. They lifted this all up and they put it on. Nobody has studied this very closely. In the, the 1400s is a century that has never been really deeply studied like the following one because of the Renaissance. Behind this, for sure, there must have been a huge knowledge about engineering with a lot of engineers and architects, for sure, at least in my view, to build this on, on the ground and lift it up with a timber crane. It's amazing, it's amazing to me. Lift it up, put it on, precisely. It would be a problem today. Today it would be a problem to do this. They did it 600 years ago. So attention has always been on the Renaissance. The century before has always been left by the side. And there are some people who are also saying that Leonardo da Vinci has been studied only some ways and not other ways. Some historians are beginning to say that his main activity was not engineering. Again, I'm putting to you what I found out, but was music, but not music, music in a party to entertain um, the guests. Now you're gonna think I'm mad. I'm just putting this to you, what I have been finding out. The music of the stars, of the universe. All this is the very beginning, so it needs a long study before saying anything. But some historians are beginning to say this. So see, and now I'm concluding my speech, the last sentence. Seeing that all this was learned on, through books and seeing that they were all books written much before the Renaissance. So there were already ideas, already fashions. Can we keep saying that Renaissance was really an encompassment of new fashions and new ideas? Question mark. Thank you very much.